What do the places where we live say about us? I want you to try and imagine way into the future. Archaeologists have just discovered our ancient civilization. They're extremely excited. First, they discover our centers of commerce. Okay, they're a little bit underwhelmed at this point. But I like to think the people in the future are optimistic, so they keep digging. Next, they find our urban landscapes. At this point in time, some of the archaeologists are starting to question their career paths. <laughs> but they per persevere, and they keep digging. And then they find our monumental structures designed to protect our most prized possessions. <laughs> what do these places say about us? What do they say about how we value the places in which we live? Over the past 100 years, nothing has dominated and dictated the design of our cities more than the car. Today's modern cities are designed for cars. For the vast majority of people, the thought of living without a car seems unimaginable, and we have built our cities around that. But the convenience and mobility of cars has come at a cost to our cities. Today's cities now sprawl over vast territories in an unsustainable way. Our neighborhoods and our communities are segregated and divided by large roads and highways. But the design of our cities over the past 100 years does not need to dictate the design of our cities into the future. Driverless cars, the shared economy, and a renewed interest in sustainable forms of transportation like walking, cycling, and public transit have a chance to transform how we think of mobility and in the process give us the ability to transform and reshape the places we live. In the future, I believe our cities are not going to be designed for cars, but instead are going to be designed for the people that live in them. Now, if we were to go around the world today, we could come across and discover many incredible and beautiful cities. These cities have one thing in common. These cities were built and predate the automobile. I say this because cities that were built before the automobile were designed to a human scale. They were built around people. When we go on our vacations, we gravitate to these types of places. When given the choice, people prefer to be in environments that are not dominated by vehicles. Unfortunately though, for the past generation, we have designed our cities in the exact opposite way. Cars are now the major design element in every consideration when we are building our cities. And this has come at a cost. Cars are now so ingrained in our society that we never even seem to question or challenge the sacrifices we need to make in our communities to accommodate this single mode of transportation. I want you to have a look at this photo. This looks like a typical North American city. Nothing out of the ordinary here. But take a closer look. Look how much space is dedicated in this urban scene to cars compared to how much space is dedicated to people. In a typical North American city, about 20% of our landmass is dedicated to road space. Think about that for a moment. Almost a quarter of our most valuable and centrally located land in our cities is dedicated to a single mode of transportation. And then we get to parking. 
For every car in our city, our cities need to build four parking stalls. We need to build one parking stall at our home. We need to build one parking stall where we work. We need to build another one where we shop and where we recreate. Now, you're probably thinking, well, that four parking stalls, that doesn't sound like too much. But when you start to add them all up, it takes up a huge amount of space. Let's imagine we wanted to try and build a parking lot for all of the vehicles in the United States of America. Well, first, we'd have to go down south and pave over all of Washington State. We'd have to cut down all of the trees, cover up all of the mountains, pave over all of the cities, and just put in parking stalls. And even after paving over the entire state, we still would not have a parking lot anywhere close to being able to accommodate all of the vehicles. So we're going to have to go over to the East Coast and take the state of New York and the state of Ohio and pave over all of those states as well. Goodbye, Manhattan. Goodbye, Central Park. Let's turn this into a giant parking lot. But even after paving over all of New York State, all of Ohio, and all of Washington State, we still don't have enough parking stalls. So we're going to have to head down south. And we're going to have to drain the swamp and pave over all of Florida State. And even after paving over Florida State, we still don't have enough parking stalls. So to finally get us to enough parking stalls, we have to go to the Hawaiian Islands and pave over those as well. I think we're starting to get a picture of what Joni Mitchell was getting at in her famous song. It is clear that cars have a huge impact on our cities and have had a dominating impact in designing all of the spatial geography in the communities that we live. But what is our path forward? How can we take a step back? How do we press a reset button on the future of our cities? Well, there are three important steps that we need to take. And the first one is relatively simple. It involves walking. Now, you're probably thinking this does not sound like the most groundbreaking thing I've ever heard, but walking is the most important prerequisite to building a livable city. If you are not able to or don't feel inclined or don't want to walk in your city, chances are you don't live in a livable community. If we want to bring our communities together, we need to make sure that they're walk walkable. The next ingredient is public transit. Now, public transit is not very sexy, it's not very glamorous, but it is a critical component to our cities. The reason it is so important is that public transit is incredibly space efficient. A highly effective rapid transit system can move the same amount of people as a 40-lane highway. Now think about that. Think about a rapid transit station compared to a 40-lane highway and the differences that those two pieces of infrastructure would have on your community. Quite significant. Public transit needs to be a part of the puzzle. And the most important step that we need to take is we need to start reevaluating our relationship with cars. Now, cars are still going to be us in the future and is still going to be an important component on how we get around. But in the future, we are going to have a unique opportunity to think about cars differently. Driverless cars are going to provide us a once in a generation opportunity to think differently about transportation. If we are able to combine driverless cars and the shared economy, we are going to be able to start to think about how we use cars differently. Now, driverless cars are not going to be a magic bullet solution. If we adopt driverless cars like we adopt cars today, chances are we're not going to have any benefits to our cities. We actually might end up building worse cities because of that. But if we are able to use driverless cars differently than we use cars today, the possibilities are endless. If we can combine it with the shared economy, we can start get, getting past the fact that everyone needs to own their own vehicle. Given that your vehicle sits idle 96% of the time, we need to ask ourselves, 
do we need to all own our own vehicle? If we can get past that, that giant parking lot that I described starts to shrink. Now, I hate to admit this, but driverless cars are going to be better drivers than me. They are going to be able to solve the long-held, around-the-globe problem of how to merge. <laughs> They're also not going to do this annoying thing that us humans tend to do on a regular basis. They're not going to be crashing into each other as often. And I think we've all had that experience when we've been driving down the road and everything slows down almost to a halt. Not because anything is blocking the road, but because some bozo up front is staring at a duck or something out the road and slows down to 10 kilometers an hour. Well, I have a confession to make. I am that bozo. <laughs> so if you put me in a driverless car, that changes everything. So if we are able to think differently about how we use cars, not only are we going to save space in parking spaces, but we're going to need less roads. 20% of our roads in our communities today are designed for human error. We are going to have a unique opportunity to be able to take some of this space back for our communities. So what does this future look like in our city if we are able to take this space back? Well, we don't have to imagine a futuristic solution because cities already today around the globe are looking at opportunities to take space back from cars and dedicate it to people. In Paris, France, along the Seine River, a major roadway has been converted into a series of beaches and public spaces. This has become an attraction for both residents and tourists alike, and it's changed the vitality and how people interact with their city along the river. In Seoul, Korea, a major highway used to go right down the middle of downtown. This highway cut off and segregated and separated their city. When it was removed, a natural waterway was restored. This place is now a green oasis and a gathering place for the citizens all around that community. Now, these type of inspirational projects are not just limited to world-class cities like Seoul and Paris. Cities all over the world are exper experimenting with trying to transform car places into people places. Whether it's building places to hang out, or building places to grow a garden, or taking a parking lot and temporarily turning it into a movie theater, cities are experimenting on how to make our cities more friendly for people. The only limit to what we can do with some of these spaces is our imagination. Heck, we can even turn our cities into a giant water slide if we want to. Now, just imagine if these fun and beautiful places were as common in your community as the roads in your city. It's an exciting opportunity. But I know what some of you are thinking. All of this looks great, those images are beautiful, but there is no way I'm giving up my car. And I get that. I don't expect anyone in this audience today to jump out of their seat, immediately put their car on Craigslist. But what I do hope is that everyone in this room here tonight can start to think differently about how their mobility choices, how their decisions about how they get from point A to point B has an impact on the cities that they live in that these decisions, probably more than anything else that we do in our cities, shapes the communities that we live in. We have some of the brightest minds in the world working on the technology behind driverless cars. But now, more than ever, we need your minds to start thinking about, dreaming about, and imagining how we can use this technology 
not the way we use vehicles today, but how we can use it to transform our cities for the better. How to make our cities more livable, fun, wonderful places to be. Now, Rome was not built in a day, and what I'm talking about is not going to happen in a day. We're going to have to take some baby steps. So, in your communities, I want you to try and get out and walk. It is the only way you're going to be able to truly experience and connect with the cities that you live in. In your communities, I want you to get out to your public spaces, enjoy them, and start demanding more. In your communities, I want you to try, maybe just once a week, to find an alternative to transportation from the car. Whether that's using a car share service, or taking public transit, or trying to walk or cycle more. If we are able to take these baby steps, we have the ability to transform our cities. When the archaeologists of the future discover our society, what are the places in which we live going to say about us? Well, my friends, that is up to you.